Nashville, Tennessee, USA. This is Jonathan Hansen, and today we've adapted a program where I was interviewed by Shannon Davis, Omega Man Radio, on April 16, 2020. We also filmed it for our warning television program, and now we've made it so you can listen to it. The title is Coronavirus, Passover, and Resurrection Day. Now, let's begin. Okay, fantastic. Everybody, welcome aboard. Coming up next, Dr. Jonathan Hansen of World Ministries International. Welcome to the end times. Are you ready to endure till the end? Come on, all who name Jesus Christ Lord. It's time to man up and report to the battle lines. Grab your coffee and sword and strap on your Ephesians 6 armor. Because the show is about to begin. From the front lines of America Babylon and transmitting worldwide on the internet and satellite. You're listening to Omega Man Radio with Shannon Davis. Well, praise God, everybody. Welcome aboard. We're live here Thursday, April 16, 2020, doing a simulcast with World Ministries International, their website, worldministries.org. And it's an honor to bring back to you Dr. Jonathan Hansen. Dr. Hansen, welcome back, my friend. Well, thank you, Shannon. Praise God. My friend, would you like to open us up in prayer tonight? <clears throat> Father God, we come to you in the mighty and most precious name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we look forward to the future future with great expectation. We're excited for what's going to happen in the future because you are there. Your angels are there. Your power is there. And you will seal your children under your blood. We don't have to be afraid of the wrath of God. So, Father God, we look forward to your miracles, to your power. We look forward to everything that's going to happen in the near future. We look forward to your second coming. Be with us now. Let many, many people be warned and listen to the message of the warning gospel of Jesus Christ so they can come into the ark, so they can be prepared for what is coming on the world. In Jesus' name, amen. I say amen to that. Dr. Hanson, the mic is yours. Okay. Last week, I did a television program titled... COVID-19, the coming plagues, the seal of God. The week before, I did one called COVID-19 versus the wrath of God. And then the week before that, I did one on the coronavirus, COVID-19 hype slash warning or coronavirus prophecy. Now, my message tonight is coronavirus, Passover, and Resurrection Day. On March 14, 2020... The Lord gave me a prophetic word at approximately 1.30 in the morning, which I spoke on television, radio, and Facebook. Quote, The Lord is saying this COVID-19 virus will go as quickly as it came. This is but a warning. Prayer alone for mercy without repentance will not work in the future. It is good that leaders such as President Trump are leading prayers for my mercy. But in the future, I demand repentance for sins of abomination such as killing the innocent, abortion, immorality, pornography, fornication, homosexuality, etc., idolatry, serving self, ideologies, philosophies, religions, etc., and dividing the land of Israel. COVID-19 is a warning that much worse judgments, plagues, are about to come. So I hope you caught that. It's going to go away as quickly as it came. Yes, the coronavirus is nothing compared to what is going to happen in the near future. Two billion people are going to die in the coming nuclear wars, plagues, famines, persecution, disease, and death. Apocalyptic events are going to kill one-third of the oceans and men, as well as catastrophic eruptions, volcanoes, weather, etc. 114-pound hailstones will be falling upon the earth. Even now, evil men are trying to take advantage of this present coronavirus to take away our freedoms and move us into the new world order. Soon, satanic forces out of hell influencing evil men in the nations to control and kill people on earth as the book of Revelation warns. The beast is rising with demons out of hell being released to attack people on earth. 
The mark of the beast is about ready to appear and nobody will be able to buy or sell unless they have its mark. Revelation chapter 13. This is the reason it is good to know about the feast of the Lord. All seven of them point toward Jesus and his power, grace, love, and protection. So ladies and gentlemen, today I'm going to review briefly the spring feast. The Passover season is the first of three feast seasons. It began on April 8, 2020 this year. Note, the Gregorian calendar gets its name after Pope Gregory the 13th is a sun or solar calendar based on the fact it takes about 365 and a quarter days for the earth to make a complete circle around the sun. Most nations follow the Gregorian or sun calendar, again named after a Catholic pope. The Jewish calendar is a moon or lunar calendar based on the movement of the moon around the earth. The days on the Jewish calendar begins at sundown about 6 p.m. and lasts for 24 hours. It takes about 29 and a half days for the moon to make a complete circle around the earth Times 12 for the 12 months add up to 354 days in a Jewish year. 11 and a quarter days shorter than the sun calendar. This explains why the feasts of the Lord are celebrated on different dates every year. Either in, uh, They're either celebrated again uh, depending if you're celebrating the spring feast or the fall feast. Fall feast but, uh, so it's a different day every year. And a different month because of the 11 and a quarter days. The Passover season includes the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits. The Feast of Passover teaches us, it teaches us how to experience the peace of God through our Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ. Frankly, not many Christians, sadly, daily enjoy the peace of God. They acknowledge God mentally, but they do not have a daily intimate relationship with Jesus where they can be led by the Holy Spirit. This present pandemic called COVID-19 has brought out the fear, worry, and anxiety that many Christians are experiencing daily, only now with more intensity. This is very sad. One, Passover. Let's look at it a moment. Leviticus 23, 4 through 5, tells us that the Passover is a memorial to the Hebrews, the Jews, and is to be celebrated yearly to remind them of how God brought them out of bondage through the words he gave Moses to warn Pharaoh. Now, the reason why we are looking at it again, because the feasts of the Lord deal all of them with the Messiah, with Jesus. The first four feasts have been fulfilled. The last three will be fulfilled. Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles. Uh, and that will be as the book of Revelation starts to take place. Starts to be fulfilled as prophecy comes to pass. But we're going to look at the feast because the miracles God did it in the past, the plagues of God that he did in the past, how he protected his people in the future. When again the wrath of God pours out upon men, the plagues come. We don't have to be afraid if you're sealed, if you're under the blood. Okay. So God's power and judgment brought the ten plagues, Exodus chapters 3 through 11, against the enemies of the Hebrews and the Egyptians. But if the people listened to Moses and obeyed God's instructions, the plagues culminating in the death angel killing the firstborn of Egypt did not touch the people of God because they obeyed the instructions and were covered by the blood. So when the death angel came, if, if the people of God had listened to Moses, uh, then the plagues did not touch them. Now, if they did not listen to Moses, they became a victim too. Celebrating the Passover should remind all of us that the same God, through his power, delivered the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt, is the same God with the same power that would deliver the believers during the plagues of God that will come upon the enemies of God during the great tribulation where two billion people are going to die. Read Exodus 12, 1 through 14. 
Exodus 12, 1 through 14. If I read it, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood, strike it on the two sides of the post, on the upper doorpost of the house, wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast it with fire, unleavened bread, with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by ordinance forever. And again, Exodus twelve forty-three through 48 reads, And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, you shall eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry it forth out of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall you break a bone thereof. And all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, you will keep the Passover to the Lord, that all the males be circumcised. And then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Okay, those are the scriptures dealing with the Passover. One, note, we see that every man was to pick a perfect lamb without spot or blemish on the 10th day of the month and observe that lamb for five days to make sure there was no fault in the lamb. On the 14th day of that month in the evening, he was to kill the lamb at his doorpost of his house and put the blood on both sides of his doorpost and above his doorpost. Now, we, we are studying the feasts of the Lord, the spring feasts. We're studying Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Why are these so important? They all point toward Jesus Christ. Now, we're looking at the past. We're going to see how it applies 1,500 later as prophecies came to pass and how it's going to apply in the future when the Great Tribulation arrives. They were to kill the lambs at 3 p.m. in order to have it eaten by 6 p.m. The commandments were for the entire lamb to be eaten, nothing to be left over to the next day. And preparing the meal, not one bone of the lamb was to be broken. To roast the lamb, according to these instructions, the lamb had to be put on a spit shaped like a crossbar so its body could be spread open. Also, no uncircumcised person could partake of the Passover meal. And it tells us today that only the family of God will celebrate the benefits of the Passover as far as being forgiven of his sins. So the death angel or judgment of God does not strike him too. In other words, we must know Jesus as Lord and Savior. It doesn't help if your father, your mother, uh, your sister, your brother knows the Lord, but if you don't know the Lord and you're a part of that family, then the death angel or the plagues of God during the great tribulation and the wrath of God, they will come upon you too. John the Baptist identified Jesus as the Lamb of God 
to take away the sins of the world in John 1 29. The next day John the Baptist again introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God. The Jews were understood religious sacrifices. They understood them and they celebrated the Passover for the previous 1500 years. They knew exactly what this meant when John the Baptist said the Lamb of God introducing Jesus. They understood John was calling Jesus the Lamb of God or the Messiah. That the prophet John the Baptist recognized Jesus as the Messiah. John 12, 1 tells us that Jesus came to Bethany six days before Passover. And on the next day, according to John 12, 12 through 13, Jesus rode into Jerusalem as according to prophecy to present himself daily to be tested for five days by the religious leaders, or should I say, the religious hypocrites. Now remember we just read Exodus 12, 1 through 14 and 43 through 48, how again they tested the lamb for five days to make sure it was perfect, without spot or wrinkle. Now Jesus again came and was queried, tested by the religious leaders for five days. Now I want you to see how this is coming to pass exactly as it had done for 1,500 years. Pilate said in 19 of John 4, I find no fault in him. Matthew 21, 23 through 27 in Matthew chapter 23. The religious leaders could find no fault in Jesus. All the questionings by the religious leaders and the Roman governor took place during this five-day period. The Jews were checking their lambs to ensure they qualified as being perfect for sacrifice. Prophetically speaking, the above fulfillment already proves the reality that the Bible is real and Jesus is the Son of God manifested in the flesh. Now let's look at more proof according to prophecy to convince even the most studious person of the reality of God. As the Jews were preparing their lamps for slaughter, exactly as they had done for 1,500 years prior to this time in history, according to Mark 15, 25, now it was the third hour and they crucified him. The Roman, Romans nailed Jesus to the cross. In Jewish time, the third hour was nine o'clock in the morning. Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled in Isaiah 53, 4 through 7. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned over our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. At 3 p.m. Jewish time, exactly, exactly as the Jews were killing their lambs, Jesus died on the cross. Now look at this. You couldn't make this up, ladies and gentlemen. 1,500 years prior. Now it's coming to pass as Jesus became the lamb, ready for slaughter, and died exactly when they killed the lambs. Listen to this. The lambs died and Jesus died at the same time, exactly fulfilling prophecy. The lambs were slaughtered with their bones being uh, not broken. And so was Jesus. Jesus bones were not broken uh, exactly as scripture said remember God commanded in Exodus 12 46 which read above and Numbers 9 12 they shall leave none of it to the morning nor break any bone of it according to all the ordinances of the Passover they shall keep it now Psalm 34 20 he keepeth all his bones not one of them is broken you know, I find that fascinating, ladies and gentlemen. Not a bone was broken. Now, as I read this next part, you're going to understand how fascinating it was. John 19, 31 states, Therefore, because it was preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, 
for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. According to Roman customs, they would break the legs of the prisoners on the cross. If they were not dead when they wanted to take them off the cross, and the Jewish leaders knew this, they also knew that six hours was too early for a person to die on the cross. That way, when they broke the legs, the person could not push himself up to take a breath as the weight of his body on the cross causes it to sag. So if you catch the point, he's on the cross, the body weight is, is so heavy, if you break the legs, he can't push himself up to get a breath. And then he dies very fast. Jesus and the other two prisoners were on the cross only six hours. And death by crucifixion could not occur until after six hours, up to four days. Four entire days. According to John 19, 31 through 33, the Romans broke the legs of the other two prisoners, but when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. So they did not break his legs, but thrust him with a spear to make sure. John 19, 36 tells us, For these things were done that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bro bones shall be broken. You know, the Bible is a third prophetic prophecy. And you see how every prophecy continues to come to pass exactly without error. Think about it. How prophecy was written hundreds of years prior to this event. And then it happened. Now you couldn't plan this. You couldn't plan your death. You couldn't plan that the Romans weren't going to break your legs because you would die so fast. Again, John 19, 36. For these things were done that the scripture should be filled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. Another prophecy fulfilled was as God told the Jews to consume the whole lamb. Nothing was to be left over to, to the next day. So here, prophecy was fulfilled as they took the body down from the cross before 6 p.m. Again, everything was to be consumed. Nothing was to be left to the next day. 1 Peter 1, 18-21 Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received from traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish, without spots. Remember, for five days uh, they... they looked at the lambs to make sure the lambs were perfect for slaughter. For five days, Jesus was tested by the religious leaders to make sure he had no fault, no sin. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, For indeed, Christ... Our Passover was sacrificed for us. Point number two. Let's look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It follows the next day immediately after Passover. And Unleavened Bread goes for seven days. Leviticus 23, 6 through 8 states. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. To the Lord seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. Now, historically, the Hebrews left Egypt. It was in such haste, they had no time to cook with leaven. As the Jews ate unleavened bread for seven days, they were supposed to remember the hardships in Egypt, how God delivered them from their old ways of life, and the sinful customs in Egypt they were now supposed to leave behind. So seven days, they were supposed to reflect how God, through His mighty hand, delivered them with the ten plagues, brought them out of Egypt... And now they are supposed to be focusing on the power of God, the miracles of God, how they can trust the peace of God. They're supposed to be focusing in on sin to make themselves right before God. The Jews are not supposed to celebrate the Passover and unleavened bread until after they meticulously clean their homes of all leaven. 
They go to great efforts at removing all leaven, even taking a toothpick to remove leaven from the cracks. They were supposed to sweep the leaven with a feather, not to touch the leaven into a spoon and burn the leaven, feather, and spoon. They cleaned everything in their homes. Walls, floors, cabinets, furniture, ceilings, etc. They not only swept, but washed, scrubbed, and cleaned. All the family members participated in cleaning out the house of leaven. Again, people, leaven represents sin. Do you see the meticulous way that the Jews dealt with leaven? In other words, that reflects on, for you and I, sin. We are supposed to meticulously allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to search our heart, especially during this time, and make sure that we are presenting our bodies, our attitudes, our values, our morals, right and pleasing before God. As Christians, we're supposed to go to great lengths at allowing the Word of God and the Holy Spirit to reveal the sin in our lives and forsake those sins as leaven represents sin. Jesus is the bread of life without any sin, so he is the unleavened bread. Now we know Jesus fulfilled Passover. He was our Passover lamb. He died on a cross exactly when the lambs died. And his blood now covers you and I, just like the lamb's blood covered the Jews, the Hebrews, from the death angel. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 states, For he hath made him to be sin for us, for who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 John 3, 5, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Jesus pointed to himself the very week. The first feast of unleavened bread was celebrated, and Jesus attended these feasts. And John 6, 32 through 35, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then he said to him, Lord, give us the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus was stating dogmatically at Feast of Unleavened Bread, I am that bread. I am fulfilling the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In John 6, 47 through 51, Jesus drives the point home as some were complaining about his earlier statement. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. So here Jesus is dogmatically tell him, telling the Jews right at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, I am fulfilling this holiday. I am the bread of life. I am unleavened bread. I am sinless. I am the Lamb of God. I am the Messiah. John the Baptist called me the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. I am now before you fulfilling the feast of Passover, fulfilling the feast of unleavened bread. Once again, some people keep murmuring about Jesus. So Jesus repeated this truth the third time. You know, people murmur all the time. You can, that's why some pastors have to preach a sermon over and over and over and over because people don't receive the truth and they have to repeat themselves and repeat themselves again. In John 6, 53 through 58, Jesus reiterates again. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I, because of the Father, so he feeds on me, will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. 
He who eats the bread will live forever. In other words, if you believe in me, if you inhale my words, if you apply them to your life, your sins will be forgiven. You'll be led by the Holy Spirit. You will live eternally forever. You will have eternal life. I am the bread of life. My blood has eternal life. My blood is life. If you receive me, you will never die. He was talking about spiritually and in the future, physically too. We will never die in the future. We will live forever. The dead in Christ will come forth. They will rise at the seventh trump forever to live with the Lord. Now, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.22, put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lust. Put it off. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, we are supposed to change. Some people say, you know, this person has never changed in 30 years. Well, I would be very much concerned if I were that person because by your fruits you know them. If you have not changed, I don't believe you're born again. Jesus said in Mark 7, 21 through 23, For within, out of man's heart, come evil thoughts of lust, theft, murder, adultery, one wanting what belongs to others, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, pride, and all folly. All these vile things come from within. They are what pollute you and make you unfit for God. So, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If you are full of lust, theft, murder, adultery, uh, fornication, homosexuality, wickedness, deceitfulness, slander, pride, etc., etc. Ladies and gentlemen, if you continue in these habits, if you don't change, you're not born again. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul commands us, quote, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelies, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It can't be any clearer. You know, there was a Democrat running 2020 for president of the United States who was an open homosexual, called himself a Christian. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he was a liar. The Bible says you cannot be a Christian. You are guilty of the lust of the flesh. You are following your own lust. You are following your master, the evil spirits, the evil lusts. You are following the spirits that damn Sodom and Gomorrah. That presidential candidate that deceived many who called himself a Christian was nothing again but a sodomite. Point number three. The Feast of First Fruits or Resurrection Day. Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of the ephod of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be a wine one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling. Now, listen to this. By the priest waving them back and forth before the Lord, he was consecrating the harvest to God. The first fruits represented the entire harvest. Now catch this. This signified that God had given them the land, and it was God who really owned all of it, including the harvest of it. The Hebrews were just the stewards of the land. Jesus fulfilled the first the feast of first fruits when he rose from the dead, representing the bride of Christ, who now has eternal life paid by Christ himself. Jesus was the human sheath that God set apart for the purposing of conquering death, 
giving us eternal life. God actually owns our soul. And we are just stewards of our life while on earth. Jesus was the first to rise from the grave who would never die again. Matthew 28, 1 through 6 reads, quote, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. I've actually been to that very tomb in Israel. John 20, 17 tells us what Jesus said to Mary. Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to the brethren and say to them, I ascend unto my father and your father, to my God and your God. Again, as the feast of first fruits, he wanted to present himself first before the Lord, before again he communed with man. Now Jesus fulfilled the feast of first fruits by rising from the dead, presenting himself before God, becoming our great high priest, in fulfillment of the feast of first fruits on the exact day that the individual sheaves had been bundled together and were being waved on earth by the Jews before the Lord. The exact same day. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going over these prophecies because it is incredible. It once again and time again and time again and time again and thousands of time if you study the Bible proves the reality of God. Matthew 27, 52 through 53 records... And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the city and appeared to many. The point here is that Jesus' resurrected, or resurrection caused others to be risen, but Jesus never died again, whereas all others did die a second time. Romans 8, 11 says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, if you're just turning in to this uh, warning television program, to my, uh, war my warning Facebook, or I'm on Omega Man right now coming live, Omega Man Radio, Shannon Davis. Uh, this is Dr. Jonathan Hansen, I'm the president of World Ministries International. And again, you're watching me, if you're watching on television, the warning television program. Again, I'm on Skype. I'm with Shannon Davis, Omega Man Radio, from Bali, Indonesia. And we're also doing it uh, through social media. Now, Romans 8, 11 says, But if the spirit of him who raises Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead also gives you life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57 reads, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Now again, the seven feasts of the Lord. Why is it important? I celebrate them, not as an Orthodox Jew. I celebrate them as a believer because the first four feasts have literally come to pass. Jesus fulfilled them. And the last three, Jesus will fulfill them. All seven refer to the Messiah. The Jews look for the Messiah in these seven feasts. We know that Jesus is our Messiah. He's fulfilled the first four. Now, the great tribulation is very close to us. We're in this COVID-19. Uh, this is not part of the tribulation. It's a precursor. It's, if you want to say, like a warm-up. Although evil men are trying to take advantage of it right now to move us before it should into the new world order and we need to really be aware of what's going on to stop the agenda of Satan working through evil men uh, ladies and gentlemen I'm going to get to that in a short time now but it says we shall not all sleep but we will be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet okay you get in the seven feasts of the Lord you have Passover unleavened bread first fruits Pentecost then trumpets here the last trumpet. Then you have atonement and tabernacles. Tabernacles when Jesus returns 
at the last trumpet and we that are alive meet him in the air and do battle at Armageddon with our Lord and Savior. That's right, he comes back as a warrior, as a judge. Time for mercy and grace, then is over. For the trumpet of the Lord dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. What is the, the law of sin? Death. So if you're not under the law, that means you have the Spirit of God in it. You have life. You're not subject to death. It's that very simple. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. But I do not want you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For is we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him those who sleep in Jesus. God will bring us with him. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those that are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we be always with the Lord. Again, the Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, Tabernacles. That's why these feasts are so, so, so important. Conclusion. The Feast of Passover teaches us to have trust and peace as God is with us. No matter what the crisis or even the plagues, God can protect us. I want you to understand that. God can, God will protect us. He has fulfilled the feast of Passover by providing His Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place so we can have the peace of God. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a nervous wreck right now with COVID-19, and COVID-19 is just the beginning, it's going to be like a picnic compared to the wrath of God, compared to the great tribulation. This is nothing. So if you have a problem right now, let me tell you, you need to have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ because you should not have a lot of anxiety and fear and worry. Did you learn anything by, again, studying the Exodus uh, the Passover, the ten plagues of God that came upon Egypt uh, to protect and, and give uh, the people of God freedom, liberate them from their bondage under slavery. Man is trying to put us under slavery right now. They're, the Great Tribulation is, is getting close. They're trying to create a new world order. But again, the same God that delivered his people from Pharaoh can deliver you and me. We don't have to be afraid. We can have God's peace. Amen? So the feast of Passover teaches us to trust and have God's peace in us. No matter what the crisis or even plagues, God can protect us. He has fulfilled the feast of Passover by providing His Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place so we can have peace with God. The feast of unleavened bread and first fruits conveys to us that we are to put aside sin our old attitudes and our values and rise from the death of lust of the flesh to be a new man. We're supposed to be changing and wanting to change into the image of God. We're not supposed to want to see what we can get away with. You know, there are people that commit fornication and adultery. Let me tell you, if you're a fornicator, if you're an adulterer, you're also a liar because you try to hide these sins from, say you live in a house with godly parents. You don't admit to them you're in fornication. You lie to them. You lie to your wife if you're in adultery. So uh, when you get into immoral sins, sex sins, you're also a liar. 
2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold all things become new. Paul explains it again in Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Unquote. Why have I traveled the world for 35 straight years? Because it's God that lives in me. He changed my life with that apostolic vision he gave me. That nighttime vision. Seeing me travel through the world, meeting with world leaders, meeting with presidents, speaking to the masses, speaking to thousands. I saw ap apocalyptic events before the return of Christ. I saw things that are happening to me right now. But I saw his heart broken. And his heart was broken because his bride was in love with the world more than me. More than Jesus. And I said, Jesus said, my bride is in love with the world more than me. And I said, why are they in love with the world? And he said, because of the man behind the pulpit. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you what. I've never forgot that. And it drives me to warn the church and leaders. I work with leaders constantly. Apostolic leaders, prophetic leaders, pastors teachers, evangelists. I work with leaders and I warn them, do not add or subtract from the word of God lest you be damned. I warn them, be a servant to God. Feed his sheep. Don't abuse his sheep. Don't make money off them. Some are so rich. They're, they're some of the richest people in their nation and their people are suffering. Something is very, very, very wrong. Let me tell you, teach the people to follow Jesus Christ. Paul explains that in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Feast of First Fruits indicate that we are to rise from the death of sin and trespasses to a new man in the spirit of Jesus Christ. And we are guaranteed to rise from the grave when we die as Jesus did to live eternally with God. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit of God, you don't want to sin. You don't want to sin. I don't want to sin. My first wife died. I never committed adultery on her. I'm married to a, the second wife now that God gave me. I don't want to have sex with any other woman. I don't want to sin. Jesus fulfilled all three of these feasts as well as a feast of Pentecost which gives us the power of God through the Holy Spirit to be Jesus' ambassadors on earth and do miracles through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, can you go and do miracles? Can you see people come to salvation? Can you see people healed? Does God use you in His supernatural gifts? He should. He should. If He is the love of your life, if you have an intimate relationship with Him, if you're an overcomer, you should be moving with the gifts of the Holy Spirit if you're in love with God. If you're not backslidden, like that vision I saw 35 years ago, nighttime vision, where the church had backslid and was in love with Himself, they lost their first love. Now, we're not talking about every Christian, but a lot of Christians have backslidden. That's why the nations have not been converted to Jesus, because the church... Many of them have become as sinful as the world. And they're ready to be judged like Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. Jesus fulfilled all these feasts as well as the Feast of Pentecost. Which gives us the power of God through the Holy Spirit. To be Jesus' ambassador on earth and do miracles through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The three fall feasts titled the Feast of Tabernacles consist of Trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. And Jesus will fulfill them very soon as the book of Revelation is about to literally be opened and all the events will come to pass. The angels will obey the Lord by opening the vials, etc. Including the blowing the trumpets with the seventh trumpet ushering in the return of Jesus Christ. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at these feasts because they are so important. You see the power of God in the past.
to bring his people out of bondage, out of slavery, from a pharaoh, from a new world order. We realize that the world is trying to create a new world order again. You look at the book of Revelation and it's the ten plagues coming again against the world. God will fight for his people once again. Two billion people are going to die. Persecution's coming. Just like the, he the Hebrews were persecuted under Pharaoh. But yet, he also fights for his people through the plagues of God. Are you sealed? Are you under the blood? Remember, the people of God in Egypt had to obey the word of God through Moses or they would suffer under the same plagues. They would be a victim. You have to be under the blood. You have to be in right relationship. You need to be moving now with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are in very dangerous times. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. exposes Bill Gates' vaccine, dictatorship plan, sites gates, twisted messiah complex. It says, Robert Francis Kennedy Jr. is an American environmental attorney, author and opponent of vaccination. Kennedy is the son of Robert F. Kennedy and nephew of the former president, John F. Kennedy. He is the president and board of Waterkeeper Alliance, a nonprofit environmental group that has helped uh, found in 1999. Again, the title of this headline says, Exposes Bill Gates' Vaccine Dictatorship Plan. Sites Gates is Twisted Messiah Complex. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I wish I had time to go into this. This is many pages. But this COVID-19 coronavirus, if you remember, my first message I did on it several weeks ago was titled, I'll read it, Coronavirus, COVID-19, Hype Warning, or Coronavirus Prophecy. Hype Warning. Let me tell you something. Evil forces are trying to take advantage of this COVID-19 to take away our freedoms, to usher us into the new world order before time, before the Great Tribulation. We must be ready to resist and stop their plans. Another headline news. Globalists using COVID-19 to usher in United Nations Agenda 2030. Brave New World Order. Ten years ahead of schedule. It says Bill Gates. Then it says Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Anthony Fossey. At a 2017 Gates Foundation Global Health Workshop on topics that included vaccine research. You know, this Dr. Fossey, who, who is standing beside Trump, uh, a short man. And uh, I'll tell you what, he's not a good guy. One, he's, he's a Catholic. He's, work, he's promoting and, and pushing for a new world order. Says it's time for all true patriots to take a stand or risk being led blindly into a new and dark age. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we must really be careful. I read, when Republican Alexandra Cortez, also known as AOC, remote, rewrote the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and rebranded them as the Green New Deal, many conservatives were heard laughing out loud. She couldn't be serious, could she? But who's laughing now? AOC has gotten most everything she wanted in the Green New Deal. And it goes on and on. How they're trying to use the COVID-19 to usher in a United Nations agenda that was supposed to come into effect in 2030. Brave new world. They're trying to push it 10 years ahead of time. Again, Bill Gates is deeply involved. Judge Napolitano, if we don't take our freedoms back, they might not come back. Teen Challenge co-founder given hydroxychloroquine Recovers from COVID-19 at 80 years old. Remember President Trump uh, mentioned this could cure COVID-19 and, and the media laughed at him. But it is curing people. Patience. The plan to kill 500 million black people in West and East Africa. Again, these are all headline news I'm reading you. Global battle erupts as Trump pulls WHO WHO funding over coronavirus response. In other words, the U.S. will stop funding the World Health Organization pending a review of the United Nations Organization's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, they're pushing a new world order. Anthony Fossey, 
set stage for mandatory lucrative vaccine. Says Anthony Fauci, America's most listened to medical prof- professional on the coronavirus, apparently on all the political, economic, cultural, and social precautions every man, woman, and child in the nation should take on coronavirus, has warned what cooler head coronavirus watchers has suspected all along this country may never, no, never go back to normal. And we could read it on and on. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is Dr. Jonathan Hansen. You're watching the warning television program. I'm also, you're watching me live on social media, on Facebook, World Ministries International with Dr. Jonathan Hansen. You're also watching and listening to me on Mega Man, Omega Man Radio, Shannon Davis. My website, www.worldministries.org. That's www.worldministries.org. I write emails every month, twice a month. If you want to get my newsletters free, send me it to email at worldministries.org. That's email at worldministries.org. I'm trying to get 200,000 people in every nation reading my emails so we can prepare them to do battle in their country for Jesus Christ. Again, my email address for those newsletters free, email at worldministries.org. I'm trying to get 2,000 intercessors to pray with us as we do battle in the nations around the world to usher in the kingdom of God. If you want to be an intercessor, write to me at ahanson.wmi at hotmail.com. ahanson.wmi at hotmail.com. Facebook, World Ministries International with Dr. Jonathan Hansen. World Ministries International with Dr. Jonathan Hansen. Roku, Warning TV, Jonathan Hansen. Roku again, Warning TV, Jonathan Hansen. My YouTube channel is Warning TV, Dr. Jonathan Hansen. Warning TV, Dr. Jonathan Hansen. My phone number at World Ministries International, 360-629-5248, 360-629-5248. You can send me a donation, World Ministries International, P.O. Box 277, Stanwood, Washington, 98292. That's World Ministries International, P.O. Box 277, Stanwood, Washington, 98292. May God richly bless you. Shannon, it was a pleasure being with you again tonight. Dr. Hanson, what a powerful word today. I really enjoyed this message. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Hanson spoke on coronavirus, Passover, and Resurrection Day. Go to worldministries.org, be part of this ministry, and support it. I know you're going to be blessed. Dr. Hanson, God bless you. Thank you to Brother Vance, the engineer, for setting it up. We'll see you back soon, brother. God bless you, Shannon. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. This is Jonathan Hanson. I hope you've enjoyed today's warning radio program. Titled Coronavirus, Passover, and Resurrection Day. My telephone number is 360-629-5248. 360-629-5248. Once again, 360-629-5248. Please telephone and do what you can because we need help. For three months now, all churches where I would be going and they would be giving me love offerings canceled on me due to this pandemic. As you know, America's been on lockdown. I have not been able to fly. Consequently, we're in trouble paying off our bills at World Ministries International because we use the church offerings to augment what came in the mail. Once again, my phone number, 360-629-5248. My website is www.worldministries.org, www.worldministries.org. Also, I send out newsletters free twice a month. We're trying to get 200,000 in every nation. If you'd like to be receiving them, write to me at email at worldministries.org. That's email at worldministries.org. I'm also trying to get 2,000 intercessors in every nation to help pray for what we're trying to accomplish in that nation. If you want to be part of my intercessors, write to me at ahanson.wmi at hotmail.com. That's ahanson.wmi at hotmail.com. May God richly bless you. I'll see you next week. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov.
Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Broadcasting on frequency 15.825 megahertz, transmitter one. This is WWCR, Nashville, Tennessee, USA. Welcome to Focus on the Family's weekend broadcast. 